Okay, everyone. Welcome. Well, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for taking the afternoon to come and join us. My name is Kamara Gray. I'm the Artistic Director of Artistry Youth Dance and I have set up this, uh, this panel this afternoon so that we can have a discussion with some of the dance and musical theatre organisations in the UK. Uh, why are we here? because we know that it's no longer acceptable to ignore or hide from the fact that racism exists in the UK. Um, we know that many organisations in a range of industries have been having discussions, but for us within our industry, we know that it's important uh, in the fields that we work with. And it's an imperative that dance and musical theatre uh, organisations show their commitment to anti-racism and what they're doing in regards to their policies, procedures and practices. Uh, we've seen the letters of solidarity from many organisations uh, and now it's a chance to hear what is actually happening in, in the space uh, so that we can share with us all because I think that is quite important. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, a very exciting panel of speakers this afternoon who represents some of the leading dance and musical theatre institutions. I thank you all again for taking the time to come and join us, all of our audience participants and panellists. I'm going to introduce each panellist first of all, they're just going to say a quick hello and then they are going to do a presentation in regards to what their particular organisation has done in response to Black Lives Matter and in regards to addressing anti-racism. So first of all, we have uh, Stephanie Ahern from London Studio Centre. Hi, nice to see you all here. Great to speak to you all. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here. We have Dr. Martin Hargraves, uh, the Director of Research and Postgraduate Programmes from London Contemporary Dance School. Hello, everybody. Uh, Julie Spencer, the Director of the School of Acting at Arts Educational. Hello. Carla Trimbamben, the Programme Leader and Senior Lecturer for the BA Honours Dance in Urban Practice at, from the University of East London. Hi everyone. Solange Erdang, the CEO of the Erdang Academy. Hi. And Sharon Watson, the CEO and Principal of the Northern School of Contemporary Dance. Hello. So, uh, thank you panellists for being here. Uh, this afternoon, uh, just for the audience, what the format will be is there'll be a pre presentation in regards to the response to Black Lives Matter and addressing anti-racism. Then there'll be a chance for questions. We will then be going into breakout rooms where we'll be looking at some of the challenges we are facing in regards to addressing anti-racism. Then finally, I will speak to you a little bit about what we are doing here at Artistry Youth Dance, the youth dance company that I, that I am the founder of, and uh, then we'll have our closing statements. So I would like to first of all welcome our first panellist, Stephanie Ahern from the Assistant Director of London Studio Centre. Stephanie, welcome. Thanks so much. Um, should I do slides or...? Um, Heather, if you'd just like to do Stephanie's slides for her, that would Sorry. be great. Thanks so much. Um, uh, whilst they're coming up, I suppose just uh, to, that, you know, thanks for having me here. It's a great opportunity, I think, for us to all share um, and, and openly share kind of current initiatives and, uh, and challenges as we come together. So I think it's really important to have these discussions and I think certainly now is a great time as we move into the autumn as well. Um, I think I really hope that they continue and, and it, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's current and it will stay current. Um, so I suppose just uh, moving on to the first slide, I just wanted to mention some of the things that we currently do at LSC um, uh, to uh, work towards um, kind of uh, pre Black Lives Matter, um, working towards a more diverse student population. Um, we at LSC acknowledge that we don't have a particularly diverse student population. Um, over the years it has changed significantly, there's been there's various reasons for that um, and we 
we have an enhanced strategy where we look at that and we look at the reasons behind that and we we uh, provide targets and, and and actions against those so we've been working towards those previously uh, and some of the the areas behind that include uh, warning to station scholarships um, financial support um, outreach that we do obviously staff training that we have in terms of unconscious bias training and things that we've had internally um, our open door policy and our LSC community and the way that we work with students at the moment um, it has been you know praised before um, uh, and, and a graduate mentoring to support students going out into the industry I think it's fair to say that that's not enough now and we appreciate that so I just wanted to kind of provide a little bit of a context so just moving into kind of um, uh, Black Lives Matter and kind of uh, after that um, in response to that sorry um, thanks Heather um, so our immediate actions following the Black Lives Matter movement uh, was to have an initial consultation with students at our student reps forum um, we developed with them we agreed that the best way forward is to really embed um, uh, a committee to really within our committee structure to really deal with the issues that are coming up um, to have a space to do it instead of it being embedded throughout all of our committees as kind of an offshoot which currently it was um, to really have a, a separate space to, to, to tackle um, some of the issues um, the committee was really there to talk about policies and procedures and our forum that we've developed is to provide a safe space for students and potentially staff to talk um, about issues as well that would report up to our committee we've conducted our first committee uh, to identify the key issues as you can imagine the first one there was a lot to talk about and i've got some key points um, here to kind of run through with you there's a lot uh, of course uh, and it's really a first stab um, that we we're looking at in terms of the key points and hopefully I've summarised them enough for you. Um, uh, if we could go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so our initial key points that we've really identified is that it must be our approach to um, Black Lives Matter is that it must be an institution wide coordinated approach. It must be embedded and it must be um, not uh, a quick answer. It must really be something we embed within our procedures so that this will continue and it will have a lasting effect. Um, we must com com uh, commit to being transparent, authentic and honest about our actions and results. And, and that we really must be clear uh, and have clear differentiation between minority groups because their experiences are different and they should be treated as such. So not to lump people in one, um, under one bracket, um, if you will. So our initial issues to tackle are the diversity of students and staff to ensure that there's an, an inclusive environment for everyone and to identify and tackle uh, systemic racism. Um, so the ways in which I think we've talked about initially we wish to do that and obviously there's a lot more that can be done um, we want to look at our do documentation obviously and ensure that it is appropriate um, we want to embed something more in our equality uh, sorry embed the committee and the forum within our committee structure also broaden LSC's values um, and our values statement to really make sure it reflects that we do have a commitment not just to um, embracing uh, the culture but really embedding it with uh, within our own practices um, to broaden LSE student and staff code of conduct ensure that there's appropriate appropriate behaviors are there and that everybody's on the same page about what is appropriate and what what is what sh how we should be talking to each other and, and language or behavior um, create a specific um, equality and diversity section within our enhancement strategy at the moment it's embedded throughout and we think we should pull it out and actually have more um, actionable um, targets so we're held accountable for what, what we're putting forward uh, and review all of our policies to ensure that there is uh, there's appropriate levels within them but also that there are a clear disciplinary procedures should people not um, uh, sign up to all of the policies uh, as discussed um, so inclusion and behavior we've talked about reviewing all of our practices within the college this could be uh, potentially um, clothing lists um, uh, nutritional information is it inclusive of all uh, cultures um, have we thought about that look at all of the practices outreach um, our auditions uh, and such there's, there's a long list there um, 
provide more student and staff induction in terms of, I think we've um, identified that students potentially, you know, they're just starting out in their adult life. They're coming from all walks of life, some more sheltered than others, and actually really making sure they understand what's acceptable behavior, not only at our college, but in the industry. Um, and, and everybody's signing up to that really. So I think it's about integrating that more from the start with students um, uh, and provide space for open and honest discussions. I think we identified that there were um, some really awkward conversations to have and people were going to be uncomfortable. And I think it's about getting that out in the open and having those discussions. And hopefully by embedding some of these things, we will be able to have those conversations, but providing a space that, that everybody feels comfortable to do that. Uh, and in terms of inclusion, obviously, how we're represented to the public. Um, so if we can just move on, thanks. Um, so in terms of education and training, review our current academic and practical areas. I think um, we've had comments from students that potentially some of our dance history areas, there could be more, um, there could be more that we could do there in terms of black dance history, how, who delivers it, how, uh, how far it goes back. Are they being discussed in the classroom? Are people avoiding some of those discussions? So I think there's a lot to talk about and think about there. Um, develop our staff development program we've um, rolled out unconscious bias training and I think well, that was a start really for us um, to have wider discussions and actually what we need to do is give staff tools to really implement um, some of those things in their own teaching um, and, and have bigger conversations. We've also implemented a mandatory completion of our equality and diversity um, online course which I know could be looked at to tick a box but I think it's important that staff do that to then have the to be able to sign up almost to the staff development program that we have to be able to, to have those conversations um, find ways to celebrate and embrace diversity within our curriculum it was definitely um, a, a desire for from students and staff not to pull things out and have things separately. Um, for example, like Black History Month, to really make sure, instead of having separate areas, to really make sure they're embedded into our curriculum and in our general processes as they go through year by year. Um, and potentially uh, provide further mentoring for students as they go out into the industry so that they can reflect on casting and what to expect. So, um, sorry, I've gone very, very quickly because I know it's only five minutes, but um, we don't have all the answers. There's, it was really um, the conversations we've been having are really only the start and um, we are committed as a college to, you know, working with our staff and students to bring about positive change um, uh, and we have an open door to that. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, yes, there's a lot to get through in five minutes. I do appreciate that. So I do uh, thank you for taking the time to do that. Just a reminder to everyone, we will have questions once everybody has presented. So I will welcome Dr. Martin Hargraves, Director of Research and Postgraduate Programs at the London Contemporary Dance School. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't have slides, so I, I will just talk uh, for a short moment about um, the impact of Black Lives Matter on what we do at London Contemporary Dance School. I'm sure many of you are aware that, that the school is part of the place, so it's a larger organisation. Um, partially it's funded through Office for Students and then uh, we also have an Arts Council funded um, part of the organisation, a theatre and artist development. And as a whole, um, Kamara mentioned earlier the um, solidarity statements, the place uh, issued a statement of solidarity with Black Lives Matter on the 2nd of June. And following that, we had um, the first of, of several letters from students holding us to account for that. So it, it really was a, um, that letter of solidarity started a conversation which we're very much uh, still in the middle of, which was to recognize the work that we're doing so far, um, uh, but also shift the kinds of language that we're using. So for example, um, one of the things that we've done since the open letter and the year group discussions and town hall meetings that we've had um, has been to shift um, the discussion around what we used to call the access and participation plan to actually um, articulate some of those principles um, into now what we call our anti-racist action plan. Um, because I think it was about um, the transparency of some of the work that we're doing that other, and we have been doing. Um, Kamara asked us a very useful question in thinking about this around how much is proactive and how much has been reactive. And I think there's been a combination of the two for us. Um, 
you know, we're held to account by Office for Students, we're held to account by, um, by the Arts Council, but we really wanted to look at ways in which um, we took our students along with us on the work that we're doing. And actually we realized when we got this open letter that we weren't being very transparent with the students, with the alumni, with artists that we work with on, on actually how we embedding um, uh, access and diversity principles within what we do. And now actually the need to translate that into language that is an anti-racist action plan. So we've published that on the website. Um, and then also similar to London Studio Centre, we have um, devised a new committee, um, which has a working title of the Equality, Divers Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And that uh, is chaired by one of our governors and will have representation across the whole of the organization. So it's a committee that students will sit on, faculty, members of the theater team, but we will also pay professional artists to have a relationship with us, freelancers, to be part of that committee. And part of the task of that committee will be to um, ensure that the anti-racist action plan actually is embedded in, into everything that we do. Um, and one of the first tasks of, the, um, of that committee will be to hold town hall meetings also. So that the committee itself will be a fairly stable um, set of members, but, but the idea is that it will always seek consultation with the wider communities that we um, interact with. And it will hold us, it will, uh, it reports all the way up to the board and then um, it addresses the students. So it's, it's, it's thinking through um, this major question that came up for us in terms of the open letter. Um, how are we communicating internally and externally our commitment to anti-racism? Um, so uh, some of the things that student asked, the students asked for in that letter were already in process, but we hadn't told them about it. Um, for example, um, we're, we've embarked on a project of decolonizing the curriculum, decentering whiteness and, and Eurocentric um, uh, genealogies of practice, and really shifting um, that focus uh, as we go, move towards a periodic review where we're going to rewrite all the programs uh, with, that, with that core principle of, of uh, decentering whiteness. But the students hadn't yet been brought into that discussion. So I think. For us, the, the reactive moment is really um, is, is one about communication. And then another thing that came up for us, and this may also happen for other institutions, is it's, it gave um, permission to a lot of alumni to get in touch with us and talk to us about historical accounts of, um, of racism. And we, we had to devise principles uh, for how we would um, deal with that and engage in those complicated um, and often very traumatic discussions uh, with those alumni on taking in, on, on us acknowledging um, the trauma that uh, was caused by institutional racism and inviting those students in um, or alumni in for um, conversations on how we could work with them uh, to move forward. So that's one of the things that we've done um, since that, that 2nd of June I guess it was a watershed moment for us. It wasn't that we weren't doing anything, but it, it really, um, it brought the urgency of what we were doing to the fore. It asked us really to think about the language that we're using. Um, and it really, um, I think it made us realize that we needed to take account for what, because we're 50 this year, um, and what's happened in the past 50 years, and how do we move into the next 50 years, um, and, uh, embed anti-racist principles at the, at the center of that. So that's a very quick summary of, of what's been happening at the place. Brilliant, thank you so much uh, for sharing that, um, Dr. Martin Hargraves. Uh, it is appreciated. Uh, now we move on to uh, Julie Spencer, Director of the School of Acting Arts Education. Oh, Julie, welcome, thank you. Hi. Hi, so I am the director of the School of Acting at Arts Ed, but Arts Ed, um, you know, you will know that it has the musical theatre and actually it's the ethos of this across the school and how we want to run the, school, the, the, whole, the whole building, the whole institution. Um, I'm going to talk about, so, um, you know, I think Arts Ed started a, a road of, of, of actually implementing things. We appointed an inclusivity and 
uh, an equality, inclusivity and diversity officer three years ago, whose remit was to look at um, uh, situations that had arisen um, through various things from students. So that, so arts ed journey started three, three years ago in terms of this. We still have a long way to go, but it started three years ago with that appointment. And actually three years ago, 11% of students were identified as black and ethnic minority. And last year that rose to 30% across the school. In the School of Acting, that's nearly 60%. Um, so there is a responsibility with that, which implemented. I came to ArtsEd in January 2019. And the question uh, for us in dealing, or for me in dealing, was that it was that who had senior management positions, you know, who teaches, what's taught, and how it's taught. Okay. Um, and uh, I think proactively, we have worked to action inclusivity. So, um, you know, instead of looking at a tick box of things, it's how do we action inclusivity? And that's the journey that we proactively have started. What does that mean? And how do we, you know, practically action inclusivity instead of ticking a box? And that's a question I think we've, we've continually asked ourselves. So the conversations about, um, you know, text, about um, movement, about um, how we refer to one's body, the language of voice, the language of the body, the language of, 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 of what we're introducing is very important. So, um, and that starts from the beginning. So that, that we want to work, we create the culture we want to work in. So um, induction is done through straight away, intimacy, um, language, um, microaggression, unconscious bias, for students and teachers across the board. That's induction. So that, that's a week of induction with, with that. And that's what we have been doing. That's what we did last year and, and will continue to do. Um, um, in terms of looking at text and widening the test, text and inviting students to bring in text, inviting students to bring in stories, folklores, myths, you know, listening to students about, about what you know where they're coming from where they're starting point even if it's a movement even if it's a, um, a song it, it's very important in terms of action and inclusivity and allowing them to bring it into the bringing it into the space so these are the things that we were doing before um, the, um, what happened happened this year and in terms of um, how we dealt with that it is 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 practically to review policies to be transparent and to be accountable. Um, we, have, uh, our, we have a board member whose portfolio is student experience. Um, so that's come into play. Anonymous reporting system, um, listening to historical um, uh, incidences and, um, and really listening, hearing, um, and being able to uh, address those points and be able to held accountable and saying, okay, so this has happened, what are we going to do about that? Um, we, uh, we have looked at assessments as well and how inclusive those are in terms of the language, in terms of like putting on a hat and having an Afro. You know, these are, these are, these are really fundamental things in dance that I think students have felt they've been, um, you know, penalized for. And it's about being really open and honest with tutors about now we look at how we implement this, how, how do we action inclusivity and the little strategies or the big strategies or the moves that we have to make within our systems. We have an open door policy. Um, we, um, our staffing, I think is a huge thing. Staffing has increased uh, in terms of black and ethnic minority staffing. And that's not just staffing bringing in casual free freelancers that means permanent staff in the building continuously every day um, and having the conversation of of with students about policies about anti-racist policies about what they want to see how you know how they think things are, are dealt with and, and they see us dealing with it so it really is i think art said is um for me the two words are transparency and accountability those are the two main things since this has happened. 
is that so students can see that there's a policy and the policies are clear. If something happens, who do they go to? Who do they report to? If they don't want to, an anonymized system where they can report it, that is done. It's also having um, a review of text, uh, a logging system, regularly updates with student union and um, students and also having past students coming in also to inform our policies as well. Um, we're also having two equality and diversity officers, one for the School of Acting and one for um, the School of Musical Theatre. Of course they'll cross but you know it's good to have the two to be able to deal with different things and come and, and, and come together and deal with it so that everyone is held um, to account. I think um, I think that's actually what we've been doing at um, Arts Ed. The conversation has to be led by the students. Thank you, Julie. That's um, really important to have that dialogue with the students and that they can feel comfortable to do that. Um, so I'm going to now introduce Carla Trimbamben, who is the program leader and senior lecturer for the BA Honours Dance Urban Practice at the University of East London. Welcome, Carla. Thank you, thank you. I know time is short, so um, I'm just gonna go through this and hopefully questions will come out. Um, I just wanna state that um, I'm a small part in the big institution of UEL and will speak on the program I lead and the initiatives I have taken part in and highlight that. So um, talking as a staff member of the university to highlight the issues and current practices. Um, so UEL has a diverse student body, but the staff in certain areas do not represent that. The dance program I lead is underpinned by challenging the dance canon and prioritizes popular and social dances that originate from the global majority. I'm not going to say Bane, let's not say that. The global majority, 75% of the globe. This, is the, this has been running for 13 years. So on a program level, we've been doing the work. Um, it's by no means perfect and there are holes as we are not consistent in getting black students to achieve a good award, which is a two one and a first. In the same percentage, so we're not good at getting them uh, in the same percentage as their white counterparts. The dance team are working on planning strategies to tackle this and it's not a consistent percentage each year. The year before that we had a very low um, uh, percentage so there was a very there was a smaller gap than this year which a gap is by 35 percent this year which is too big um, so the dance team are working on the strategies to tackle this I am the only black brown person I say black brown because you know in some spaces I'm black in some spaces I'm brown it depends who's in it um, in the permanent teaching staff, I'm the only black and brown woman. I make sure the students get representation through the visiting lecturers I hire. I make sure students see themselves in the work I show in class. I make sure people see themselves, my people, see themselves in the marketing for the programs so they, are, so they know that they're welcomed. I have to be extra hot on this. I'm tired as I've constantly having to remind people why this is important. Things are changing and it's ridiculous that now only people are coming on board. I have been in conversations with my line managers and deans and they're on, they, they are really supportive of me doing this and you have to have the support of your deans and your line managers. And um, now they're helping me to, to figure out how I how we change the job descriptions to allow um, black brown ethnic minority people to feel like they are welcome to um, apply for the for the positions and roles. Um, I don't want visiting lecturers, just visiting lecturers that, you know, display black and brown and minority ethnic people. I want permanent members of staff to sit around a table with me so I can see people stare back at me and see myself. A PhD is deemed necessary or equivalent experience, but it never is deemed equivalent. Exclusive practices that are part of the systemic racism and classism lives within this institution and these needs to be challenged and so my line managers and my deans empower me to do that. For the students, the university has been working on reducing and eradicating this award gap that I mentioned and Black Lives Matter has been a trigger to accelerate and push the work that was going on before. 
The school that my area sits in, which is the arts and creative industries, has one of the highest award inequalities, as I stated. This is a result of systemic racism, and this is being recognised as the issue of the university and not the student, as they should not be carrying the burden of that emotional labour. So asking students to be part of it, yes, but what do the students get out of it? Staff training and forums have been created to talk about these issues and we have a black academy who hold training sessions and forums and a white anti-racist group is being piloted um, and it's been formed to acknowledge that white people need to analyse their actions. The award gap work is part of staff's appraisal so they are made accountable. This work is led by the appointment of our Dean of Office for Institutional Equity, Dr Marcia Wilson, a black woman. We have weekly forums to share and inform us of practices that are going on to er eradicate inequalities. So there are practices within the university, but the sharing of knowledge doesn't usually happen because we're time poor. And these are now being brought forward so that we can have great provocations and we can present each other's ideas and thinking and have really uncomfortable conversations. But fruitful uncomfortable conversations on a policy level the anti-racist policy was being rewritten before uh, this current movement of black lives matter was happening and a process of consultation with students black staff um, Asian minority ethnic staff was happening and that and that's really important. You can't write these policies without consulting. Um, I was interviewed, interviewed, students were interviewed and the policy is still being um, written because now it's realized that it should be an equity policy and, and because of all different um, issues coming within that. So it's still being written and these forums are being part and part of that. I'm sure on a macro level, it feels like this isn't lip service. I'm sure on a micro level, there are certain parts that are lip service, but it feels a, like a positive initiative and um, a push forward. What I think needs to be done, my final point, is that it would be great as, for the workplace and studio space to have definitions of what racism and microaggressions are. Alicia Mulligan has something on, Mulligan has something on Facebook, which is great for, as a starting point and development for student and staff. But the main thing is the emotion labor is not for the global majority, but the for the white staff to take on. Uh, thank you, Carla. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned uh, so many things there that, that I know people can share and relate to, especially the notion of being tired. It is very challenging to continue to have these conversations. Yeah, man. Too tired. Yes. Um, so even myself, this point last week, I wasn't going to hold this session, but I, I realised the bigger picture and the need for us all to come together to hear what is being happening, to hear what is happening and what is being done. So uh, yes, to for everyone to be mindful that it is very exhausting if you are the recipient of of racism to continue to have these conversations. So we we do want change to happen. Um, I'm going to uh, move on to our next speaker, who is Solange. Erdang, the CEO of the Erdang Academy. Thank you, Solange. Hi, um, I did do a presentation, um, but I'm not quite sure if it hits all the marks and I'll extend on that if we can share that. Who's, who's, oh yeah, thanks. I'm not very good technically. So um, the first thing I, I do want to say that um, Erdang's founding ethos was diversity and still is. Um, my late mother came from South Africa because of the apartheid system and continued to fight racism in the UK on arrival. Um, so I, I was brought up with um, those discussions around the table at dinner. And so um, it was very important for me to take over that ethos, um, although we're more musical theatre than ballet. Um, so um, a third of the students are non-white, mostly African, Caribbean or mixed heritage, um, as are the staff actually, and I forgot to put that in. Um, and it's always the way it 
it fluctuates between 30 and 40 percent depending on on the year um i've got to say until about 10 years ago we didn't um have that figure we didn't count it was just the way it, it was um and then when we started giving figures for Ofsted, we realized um you know that that we were um that we had a lot a lot more than a lot other institutions i guess um at that time um things have changed since then so um Erdang in the 70s as a ballet school um i have always and my late mother as well has always questioned the industry um i've sat on a lot of panels representing diversity and voc vocational training um like for one dance and other other panels um and questioning the whitewash of the industry and and what's going on um in order to change um i've personally seen change in the last 10 years a little bit um but there's still a lot more work to do um yeah so I, i've spoken on a lot of panels i've attended a lot of debates but not much action has ever happened and i've always found that quite frustrating i've also got a blog which i need to update about the history of Erdang and its anti-racism st stance and the way we were brought up. So there's Erdang in the eighties. Um, so what has Erdang been doing? We've been doing lots of outreach, um, funded it ourselves. I think there was one year where um, our colleges got funding to outreach um, and then it was taken away. So it's really important to do it. Um, we go into schools, we give scholarships out um, in order to access training, especially for the foundation course. We, we do do a lot of scholarships for those kids that might not have had dance lessons um, since they were four or five, um, so they can catch up and join the three-year course running rather than not having the, um, the dance classes from, from being a child. Um, we go into colleges, schools, um, and we we invite um, youth groups in um, to the building, and that helps uh, kids see themselves in a professional training environment um, within the arts. So it's in order to make kids feel comfortable, because um, it's obviously a very unusual backdrop for a lot of kids um, to come into institutions like ours. Um, casting directors come into Erdang and I'm sure other colleges in search of black graduates. Um, and in conversations I've had with a lot of the um, casting director, um, they are finding that uh, black performers turn down work. Um, and that to me means that we're not producing enough talent um, to feed the industry. So. I've, I think colleges are responsible to make sure that the theatre changes. So we need to produce enough talent for the casting directors to be able to um, choose um, for casting. Um, to 2018, 90% of non-white students got an elite contract within six months, opposed to 60% of white students. Um, so again, that says we need to produce the talent um, in order to change the industry, um, especially when it comes to creatives and musical theatre. Um, there is a shortage of um, black creatives in the industry and until that changes, and, um, I don't think the, the snowball will start happening um, for a lot of change in musical theatre. Um, a couple of years, well, um, 2016, I did um, an interview for a publication called Centre Stage. And my belief is that age 12 is where the um, outreach needs to start. Um, um, and one of the reasons why over a year ago I co-founded the Black British Theatre Awards, and that was to enable um, kids to see themselves that was my reason my co-director omar's reason was more to do with um creatives to to um uh, highlight creatives in the industry but my reason for doing it was to show successful role models in order to encourage the next generation to see themselves and take 
um, vocational training up. Um, so with the BBTAs, we do, we're doing a digital series of short films and some outreach to engage youngsters. And hopefully this will make some contribution to change. Um, in the late 2010, actually, we, we were the first college to do a full black cast of Small Island as the Broadway um, original. And we're very proud of that. We, we haven't really done anything since, but I remember at the time it was quite something. So our graduation year, we're able to do a full black cast, which was really, really wonderful. So since the George, the George Lloyd global protest, um, it's time. This is an opportunity to step forward and never step back. Um, to me, Black Lives Matter has been a struggle for years beyond theatre, beyond our generation. Um, for instance, in 2018, we did a move it, uh, Dang Nation, No Struggle, No Progress, where we put on numbers about freedom and Rosa Parks uh, in response to Black Lives Matter then, um, and to raise student, staff and public awareness to, to Black history. Um, so we do, um, at most shows, we would have something to do with um, Black history. Um, However, even our staff and students are not always supportive of Erdang's anti-racism stance. And our feed, any feedback within the college is vital to ensure black students feel comfortable at all times. I.e. micro-racism going on, um, comments on behavior, and students just not understanding each other or not respecting their background. Um, so um, what has come out of um, the last couple of months um, is the students um, spearheaded the African and Caribbean Society, the Erdang African Caribbean Society, with help from some staff. And this is still being developed. Um, they came forward with um, some issues um, and we decided to get together and start a society. Obviously we have the Erdang Society of Students and this is now um, another society um, specifically looking at race. Um, so the students will lead the staff training in cultural sensitivity and awareness, microaggression, outdated phrases and mental health of students. We're actually going to make that a course and the students can actually be trained to deliver it elsewhere in the theatre industry. So not only will they deliver it to our staff, excuse me, my dogs are barking, um, <laughs> but um, they will also be able to deliver it outside of Erdang. Um, so when they go on into the industry, they will have that um, accreditation. So it's gonna be accredited. Um, they'll do um, black anti-racism events and social media campaigns. They now have their Instagram up and running. Uh, points of contact for students. We have certain, um, actually Kamara's one of them, the ambassadors with Neo um, in staff um, to be able to ask about race, signposting to Erdang support resources and racial disciplinary processes. Um, they will support Erdang's community outreach, develop their network with students and other performing arts institutions. They will lead on black history curricular and extracurricular performance training that reflects black heritage and dance accent training, etc. Uh, race and casting forums and networks. Um, Erdang is also reviewing and making, oh, excuse the typo, sure policies are fit for purpose. So not only taking the government guidelines, but also reflecting um, policies within the unique industry and training that they are in. Because I, I, I would say it's more sensitive than a lot, a lot of other industries um, as far as being your, you are your product. Um, we've now hosted five Let's Talk About Race Zoom chats. And we've had guests from Miriam Teak to um, Claude Amar, Jason, uh, Koji Radical, who's a, um, a grime artist, uh, Prexy Nesbitt, who is um, an activist that marched with um, Dr. Luther King. So we've really um, really broadened the um, the race talk debate, um, not only for industry people, but for people from other walks of activism and the arts. So um, we, we've got the next panel next week.
Um, and I'm just going to plug the Black British Theatre Awards. So we're, we're launching, we have a recognition list um, at the Black British Theatre Awards, which is everyone that has performed on a Salt Theatre stage within the year. Uh, Vanessa Fisher puts that together. So now we're going to make it into the Global Black Theatre Directory um, in order to um, ensure access to Black artists, creators and educators. And that's being developed as we speak. Um, and the nominations for this year close um, in three or four weeks. So don't forget to vote. And thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you, Solange. <laughs> your dogs as well for the contribution. Um, but we appreciate uh, you sharing. I'm going to move straight on to our next speaker, Sharon Watson, CEO and Principal of the Northern School of Contemporary Dance. Sharon, welcome. Thank you. Well, I'm at the end. Okay, I hope you're all still alert. Um, what I want to start with, first of all, is just to say to you that I'm six weeks into my job and six weeks um, and Black Lives Matter kicks in. So uh, the first thing I felt I absolutely had to do was to go and find my black and brown students. Um, and that was to find them, to make sure that they, uh, if they wanted a safe space to, to kind of express how they're feeling, how the situation was um, impacting them and just to be able to find someone to talk to. So that was the very first thing I took um, as, a, as a priority. So the Northern School of Contemporary Dance, we are located in the heart of Chapel Town for anyone that doesn't know its location. It is, um, I would say, primarily uh, a black and Asian community. Um, the school is reaching its, what, 38, 35 years old. Um, and the reason the school started was because the founder, uh, Nadine Senior, did not want her students, of which the majority of them were black students actually leaving the city and going elsewhere to train. So she, did, she created this establishment of which I have been a lecturer here previously, as well as a student here. So it kind of feels like coming home. And by coming home, the idea is that actually we, we respect and recognize its location and its community, as well as the students that are actually coming through the door. I'm gonna to be totally honest with you. I have not had taken time to look at any policies. Um, what I do know without even having to look at the policies that they're not working. Um, if they were working, I wouldn't be sat in a, in, a, in a space that actually looks the way that it does. So I've made that very clear that that is not my priority. My priority is um, at this stage is to find the students to be able to give them an environment, a safe environment to talk and to find out where they are. Um, they've become very, very invisible in the situation in, in the school environment. So that was my, my first job and I've spoken to uh, what was the, um, initially they were the Bain Society. They have relabeled themselves as the people of a global majority. And what we've also done is reached out to the uh, conservative schools that are part of the CBD and invited other schools to come and talk to us, to come and be with us, to come and find a platform for where we can discuss the, the challenges of being black and Asian or and ethnic minority. So that's, I had that in, in my six weeks, I think I've had the conversations probably six times uh, once a week, just to kind of keep them abreast and support them as we kind of move through the situations that we're dealing with. Um, as a school, we also have a theater, the Riley Theater. Um, and within that, we're an MPO, which means that we can program and we also can devise work as well. So the job that I've also been doing in support of the changes and the challenges is entering the Zoom rooms where the conversations around black work has, has been, well, has not been represented. So that, in a sense, has been part of my job is to kind of question and challenge uh, what on earth has been going on with the creative case through the Arts Council funding for the NPLs and why on earth um, you are now all suggesting that you have one-to-one -one conversations so that you can talk about black and Asian work. Well, I'm happy to do that. And I have been on behalf of the global majority of us to kind of shine a light on the things that haven't been happening. Um, I think one of the, the biggest things for, for me over these few weeks in terms of action is to really embrace that uncomfortable space um, and to invite everybody into them. Because as the majority of us that are black or Asian will understand, we've operated in that space for the majority of our careers. So it's about actually being able to put that center forward to understand that the dialogues have to be part of that conversation. And that's the conversation I'm also having them and encouraging our students. And there I say the staff of which um, I have invited to a let's talk conversation around what on earth is going on. 
that has been embraced um, and I've since discovered that there's anti-racist training and, and unconscious bias training that's going on but actually what was really quite open for me in terms of uh, rewarding was to understand that each member of staff that actually are here have wanted the platform to be able to have those conversations so that's been uh, I've embraced that and we're continuing to have that um, the the questions I asked the students that um, in the first instance was actually what do you need right now um, uh, it's not about as I say about the policies it's not about kind of protesting it's not what do you actually need right now what is going to make you um, kind of take that step forward and try to find an environment that actually you feel that you have a space and a place and, uh, and a, an opportunity um, and you know we've started making very very um, simple changes in that uh, one of the if you wanted to just so we've increased our, 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 our library resources in the first instance and actually talking about a black British experience in the first instance for which most of the students have said we can't see ourselves so in and amongst all of that um, there's a few blogs that the students have started writing just to be able to express themselves and to feel that they have a voice and it's also been respected by the wider sector um, and within the CDD also just challenging what they have as, as action and policy because actually the establishments that are above um, my environment right now are all run by all white and, and very often all male. I'm running out of time, I'm aware of that. Um, but yeah, the conversations are ongoing. Like I say, six weeks in, it's very early, but what I am doing is cradling those black and brown artists and students. Thank you so much, Sharon, uh, for sharing that information. Uh, so now we do have a few minutes for questions in regards to what has been uh, discussed or what has been presented so far, you need to use the raise your hand function uh, to, to ask your question. We only have a few minutes, but we do also have the breakout room sessions where you'll be able to speak further as well. So if there is anyone who wants to ask a question, now is the time. Okay. Makes it very easy if there are no questions. Um, Sorry, Kamara, it's the Acousia. I couldn't find my hand. But I, I, I put a thumb up as well. So, okay. uh, so uh, Akusua, and then I'll come to you, Dolly. Okay, Dolly. Um, I'd like to start off by saying to everybody, thank you so very much for um, making the time to be here. Kamara, um, this is a great opportunity. Um, thank you for initiating it. I'm not sure if it's so much of a question as just wanted to maybe Ex ex express much of what I've been feeling over the last few, um, uh, not even the last few years, I would say the last 30 um, years, and I'll try and make it very quick, Kamara, as well. Um, Carla, you mentioned um, tired. Um, for me, it's more than tired, in addition to what you have mentioned. We as Black people have been suffering under the consequences of Black supremacy and it's time for that to basically change. Myself and my colleagues time and time again have found ourselves in a situation where we are professionally stagnated. Progression does not exist. It's great to hear that the place has 50 years and are looking forward to 50 more years. How old is Irie? And how old is the ACE institution as well? And yet there are other institutions, if we count, we can count on more than one hand, other institutions that celebrate um, the various forms that we have. And so I just want us to really start to think about going forward. Karamara, I would like to, you to make a note that although a lot of institutions have made um, pledges to support the various letters and to support Black Lives Matter and to support certain anti-racist policies, for me, you know, we can check ourselves a mother can check their, their, their child's um, bedroom and make them accountable. However, if you are living alone and you're accountable to yourself, that does not go anywhere. And like Ofsted assesses particular schools, I think this accountability should be taken out of the hands of the schools and in institutions. We have suffered too long for it to go back to a board, accountability to go back to a board and to go back to individuals that come um, on the board like myself in institutions. And that's something I'd like to make a suggestion of. And at the moment, that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Akosia. Yes, accountability from outside is very important. Um, 
so uh, perhaps we can have further spaces like this that's something that everybody can can discuss whether that will be useful uh, Dolly Henry please yes hi everyone and great thanks uh, Kamara for bringing us all together um, I have been teaching in performing arts colleges for I can't even discuss how long far too long um, and for me I find that everything that's been said and I take it from Carla and I take it from Sharon because obviously I can connect to what has been said and Acusia, because I am a black creative artist in a performing arts institution or institutions and I have to say as somebody who wants to teach our diversity and wants to teach from my point of colour that has always been stopped so I think for me what I recognise is it's the management structure until we change the management structure that doesn't actually filter down to the ground level to then though the students being able to see from the top because we're talking about what we're giving the kids on the ground but if it's not available and we don't see it at the top and those of us who've been around long enough to be in those positions to help and support if we're not allowed to get to those positions nothing it's nothing's really going to change that's from my own perspective because I can tell you now I'm going through some hellish times with Trinity Laban because I'm there some of you may know the story some of you may not but I'm not going to express it on here but it is so institutionally racist that I'm having to take take it further and I don't want to do that in an art form where it's you know for the last i can you know even when i went to lanes i was the only black student i had no white I, you know it was all white teaching and i don't understand we're looking at how to fix it on the ground but actually we have to fix it from the management structure level there has to be representation and it is about dialogue around the a corner and uh, around the table and i've tried to have many a dialogue and actually in fairness have been removed because i'm seen as trouble but I'm not trouble, I'm trying to fix it and level it out. So it's a mindset and it has been quite interesting over these last six weeks that as black folk, we have found a voice and finally we've been given a voice to speak about what is wrong. And it's interesting that all the students, black and white, feel that they are being deprived of diversity. It's not just the black kids, it's the white kids because they are grown up in a period of time where it wasn't, it is diverse. Some of them have said to me that they're coming into college, sorry I won't take too long, they're coming into a college where they've, they've studied at a lower level and they've been at school and they're in diverse situations. So it's around them, they get to performing arts college and it's gone that diversity. They have nowhere to speak, they have nowhere to take their pain, they have nowhere to take their fear, they're scared to say anything in case it comes out in other ways against them. And it is the micro to the overt. It's right from top to bottom. So from my own experience, I'm not giving myself time to say it all. And I've thought about this and I thought, should I say anything or should I keep my mouth shut? Actually, no, management. We've got to start at the top. It's not the boards, it's the people that make decisions. Um, we have to be represented in that. Um, absolutely, thank you, Dolly. Sharon, I see you nodding. So would you just like to quickly respond to that uh, question about management? Yep, um, I think uh, it's pretty obvious that I've, I've arrived at a position where actually I can influence change, but until the point where I am um, at many, many schools, actually you don't see yourself in that situation. You also become, you also conform to what the white stereotype and the white, um, the white Western way of working and thinking becomes part of your, your, your mandate. And that's really unfortunate that you start to whitewash yourself as an individual mm -hmm. because your environment is really challenged. Um, I do. I think it's about the decisions around the curriculum. It's, it's possible that those conversations and that action can be taken to your board for ratification. So when you're told that you are here now to lead your school, then you know what your job is. So for me, I understand exactly what my role is right now. Um, but I'm one of you. And uh, it's important that we understand how collectively we actually need the voices of those white um, individuals, the white teachers, those that are in, in positions to start talking and start being honest about what it is that they're not doing and actually be able to take that much further in terms of a management system and structure. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Sharon. Um, okay, on that note, because I'm aware that we're a little bit behind schedule and we want to achieve uh, the things that we want to achieve. So we're going to move into our breakout rooms now. Uh, we have a question for the breakout rooms, which is in response to Black Lives Matter and addressing anti-racism. What are the most challenging issues in regards to implementing change, either for you as an individual working within dance and musical theatre organisations or for you representing an organisation? So we are going to put everybody into breakout rooms now. You'll have the chance to speak more there and then we will reconvene in 15 minutes. Thank you, everybody. Tamara, just to remind, how much time do we have? in the uh, breakout rooms? For the breakout rooms, we have 15 minutes, so we will come out of them at 5.20. It will now be 5.20, thank you. Now, um, really interesting conversations happening, uh, very conscious of the time that it is nearly uh, time to wrap up and we've still got uh, a couple of things left. So I'll just ask if there are any rooms that particularly want to feed back uh, a couple of points. Um, Sally, Sally's room will go first because she needs to leave early. Wonderful, Sally, thank you. Hey, okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I made some brief notes, so I'm really happy if colleagues in the breakout room with me want to clarify or to chip in if, if needs be. Um, uh, and I've got awful writing, so please forgive me as well. Um, uh, so Sharon uh, started off with um, wanting an acknowledgement that actually this is happening um, and that one, one of the challenges is to um, get people to step up to the table and for the broader public and the industry and the sector to actually acknowledge that Black Lives Matters is happening and that it needs to be addressed. Um, Mercy then spoke about this being um, we are kind of living in a time of a triple crisis of health, race and the economy. And that actually there's a lot of information about each of those separately, but actually the impact of that feels very, very interconnected. So perhaps we need to start looking at that from a more interconnected perspective and for people to be accountable for each of those and obviously them uh, in a, a more interconnected way. I spoke about my perspective of working in HE, higher education, and that a challenge is that whilst on the ground we see the potential for change and we see where the curriculum might shift, for example, that actually the wheels of higher education actually turn quite slowly in terms of processes, deadlines, paperwork, meetings, etc. So we are sort of at the mercy of the slow wheels of HE, which is a challenge. Um, Natalie spoke about, um, mm, I made a very brief note here, so apologies, Natalie, um, that we need white people to be doing the labor to begin to make that change. And I think that ties into the point about management structures and how we need to be able to, to, to kind of break that a little bit and challenge that. Johnny spoke about, um, and Johnny, your sound for me was not super clear, so I apologise if, if I've kind of missed this, but there's a challenge um, that we don't fall into tokenistic gestures, that actually any message that is put out there, any change that, that is made is authentic. Um, it's not a kind of token gesture. And then how can those people be held accountable for that? Um, not sure how long I've got. I've got just uh, two more points. Um, Sharon spoke uh, about um, that there's a deficit and that black people have been doing the work and doing, doing the labour for a long time. Um, and it has to be about action, not policy. Um, and then I made a point that I didn't write down because I was saying it about acknowledging the point that Carla made earlier on about black people feeling tired um of firstly the context the situation but also i wanted to acknowledge that i appreciate that black people might feel tired of being asked what do we need to do to make it right what do we need to do to kind of make change um and then sharon spoke uh, about that latterly and sharon i didn't write it down because i was just listening so i'm <laughs> sorry i'm really sorry and whether you just wanted to 
summarise your last point in the in the breakout room? Sorry, the, the fact that um, black people have been doing the heavy lifting for such a long time and the, the actual the, the idea that you actually do need black people in the room, although it's not our responsibility, because I think there's a real concern that actual the white people will talk about this for such a long time, they'll go around in circles, they'll comfort themselves with their white solidarity and therefore that will not change anything. So yes, you do need black people that have the, um, the ability and the strength and the desire to be in those spaces. That's a big summary of what I, I was explaining. <laughs> Great, thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, I'm aware that there is, I'm sure, a lot of the issues that were raised are, uh, will overlap. So if anyone has any new points that there was raised in the room that they would like to share with the group, please come forward. So if there are any additional points, any new points? Yeah. Can I go ahead? Yes, absolutely. Um, we we touched on the lack of acknowledgement of the bigger picture and for um, the challenge that the change to take place and challenges to be able to implement things that the bigger picture needs to be understood because that affects the changes that are listed on on paper we talked about the fact that it's not just about funding because that's the excuse that's always given but it's about the education and for those who are making the changes there there's a need for them to understand the plight um, acknowledging racism is one thing practicing um, anti-racism is another the problem and then the solution and we mentioned that it's um, part of the, the challenge also is that it's bigger than dance, although dance is a topic right now, it is bigger than dance and it goes wider and it's much more across the board. The other thing that also mentioned was that, yes, we're making a list of things that needs to be changed, but without a coherent timetable, without milestones, a time frame to actually say that this should happen in this particular time and so forth, we just, it's, it's, it's it, we're just, the nightmare is going to continue. And in fact, we have been living a nightmare and it's time for it to stop. Thank you, Akusara. Um, if there is one more room that would like to raise um, one point that they discussed, please. Uh, Dolly. Yeah, hi guys. We talked about, we tried to talk, well, I spoke a lot as well, as usual, but um, we tried to talk about education, how we as educators bring this forward, how we, as I was saying before, work through it. We, what do we know and what do the white teachers know? And often we as black um, creators and, and practitioners, we know both sides. So what we were trying to discuss or what I was trying to help understand is that if the white teachers and the white educators can almost see it from our point of view to be able to go okay that is what should be happening so it's about how we view ourselves as educators and what we then put out if we don't have the knowledge as the educators we can't put it out so we talked about things like that the multi-perspective of everything open keeping the open narrative which then kind of lent us to talking about uh you know Greta was saying about the decentering of the whiteness. So we, we're always seeing it from the white perspective if we were allowed to be brought in and not be on the outside so much as black practitioners who have a wealth of knowledge, who have a wealth of experience, who can be identified and students can identify with us. But again, it's going back to the structure of how it's been put together. Uh, and with the last thing we talked about was losing the momentum. We don't want to lose the momentum of what is actually going on now. And it kind of picks up from what Sharon and Akusa has said that, you know, we can have, we're having these discussions and we're having lots of platitudes and appeasements on paper, but unless we put it into action and really action it, is it really gonna make any difference? And it can only make a difference if we know what the difference is we're trying to do. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, uh, Dolly. Um, action is very important here, um, and we don't. What we don't want to happen is uh, lip service, um, as people have mentioned. And I think something that has been mentioned that is very important is accountability, and that is key here. Accountability, uh, holding people to account in regards to change. I am aware of the time, um, so if you do have to leave, um, then thank you for that. But I am going to quickly say what 
we do at Artistry Youth Dance and why I put this forum together. So I am the Artistic Director of Artistry Youth Dance. It's a youth dance company that's based in London and it was set up to support, showcase and celebrate young dancers of African and Caribbean descent. And the reason why it was started was because of many of the things that have been raised here. I recognised that there were just no, I couldn't see any, many black students in many of the institutions that I was working with or that I had associations with or see them in the shows and productions that I was interested in. So I recognised a need to have a safe space for them to develop, uh, thrive, be empowered and to develop alongside everything else that they do because they don't just come to us, they do go to uh, many of the organisations that are here today. Um, so I thought it useful to share some of the things that we do uh, in case it is helpful for other people. Uh, we do teach predominantly, uh, mainly regularly j jazz, contemporary, modern, Horton technique and ballet. And the reason why is to prepare them for the schools that they want to go to. And as people have said, ballet is an entrance which is may or may not be the most useful way to enter people uh, that's one thing but we work a lot with dance forms of the african diaspora as well so we work strongly with choreographers who do focus on that dance form we commission choreographers every year to create a piece for us and they represent a range of dance forms from the african diaspora so we have worked with a lot they're all UK-based choreographers as well, like Alessandra Soutin and Valela and Dabeni, uh, Elaine Dance, um, Sean Graham, Jared Martin, uh, Vicky Bokwe, New Chenna Dance. So there are the resources here in this country for people to access. We also have sessions on dance history with the living pioneers. That is another thing that our country is, is lucky to have, uh, many of the pioneers um, of Black British dance are very much alive and accessible uh, and we bring them in to speak with the young people. Uh, so that is something that that does need to be accessed. Uh, we, um, so we have people like Namron, um, I can see Greta Mendes in, in the room here, um, Carl Campbell, uh, Carol Straker, some people that have come in and just talk about their careers with the young people. We have done exchange programs where people look, the young people look at identity, culture, black history. We've worked with Untold in Amsterdam, and we've also had young people go to America uh, with a choreographer called Anthony Burrell, where they've studied. So that is a chance for them to develop there. We are very big in showing them representation on stage. Uh, so we take them to live theatre, that is something we are very passionate about, uh, showing them representation so that they can develop in a range of styles and we really think it's important that they get the choice to choose what style they want to do, uh, which is why we do teach everything from ballet, jazz, contemporary and dance forms of the African diaspora because they shouldn't be limited in what they choose. If they do want to decide to be a ballet dancer, they should have the freedom and the choice and the knowledge to do that. Um, not be dictated from outside. So we see a range of shows. I can see a lot of companies in the room. Uh, we've seen most of you live. Um, and we've carried that on in lockdown as well, where we have Zoom sessions to, uh, to show the shows. We did Ballet Black, we've done New Channel Dance and so many other companies. Um, and so that the young people have and, and get support there. And, and have aspirations that are high, very important. Um, and then one thing that we did last year that was very uh, big is an in initiative called AYD 100, where we uh, wanted to take 100 young black students to see the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theatre. So we collaborated with Settlers of Oslo and taking 125 young people. We also did a series of workshops with many of the schools that are here where they gave out scholarships. This was a big thing for access. Uh, 42 scholarships were given out to the young people. Um, many of the young people still going to the courses at those institutions, particularly London Studio Centre and Erdang Academy. Uh, we also had Romba, Trinity, Irie Dance Theatre as well. And um, that was a big thing, uh, collaborating with community organisations uh, that created real access for the young people to see what the schools did because really they hadn't heard of many of the schools. So I know that there are initiatives out there happening, but my young people still hadn't heard of, heard of most of the places um, until we did those workshops and collaborations. Um, 
So it's really important to connect with community organizations and have real significant programs uh, that uh, link and that are long term. We work with other organizations such as Akamasa Arts and Impact Dance, uh, who also do a lot of great things for young people as well. So those are some of the things that we do at Austria Youth Dance. You're always welcome to get in touch, uh, to speak to us about anything. Um, one of the main reasons why I put this platform on, one was to hear what people are doing, but I no longer felt comfortable in recommending schools to my young people if there wasn't a program to support them, to support the teachers, to have real diversity in curriculum. I just wasn't prepared to do that anymore. So um, it's good to hear what people are doing. As many people have said, accountability is key. Follow through with the change, um, decentralizing, uh, the curriculum and one thing that i will say that i did hear from a talk it was with uh, thomas talawa presto he mentioned um that the word microaggressions doesn't exist in any other form of prejudice there's no micro homophobia there's no micro sexism so it's also important about the language that we use microaggressions there's just racism and it needs to be removed um, so taking on board everything that people have said there's definite room here for a follow-up conversation. If you're interested, please, of course, let me know. I will share all the information uh, with people in the chat. People have put their contact details. Please put your contact details if you want them shared, um, and I'm happy to do that. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for taking the afternoon to join us this afternoon. Um, you could have been at many places, but you are here. It's a very important conversation. I thank uh, the panelists, uh, Stephanie Ahern, London Studio Centre, Dr. Martin Hargraves, London Contemporary Dance School, Julie Spencer, Arts Educational, Carla Trimbamben, University of East London, Solange Erdang from the Erdang Academy, and Sharon Watson, Northern School of Contemporary Dance. Uh, thank you to also the Astri Youth Dance team, Tina, Heather, and Talia. Um, you can get in touch with them. I will also share their details. I will send out a group email so that you can contact people if you want to and if you have uh, further contact that you, you want to make. My name is Kamara Gray. I'm speaking very quickly so that we can all get on with what we have planned for our at-home lockdown evenings. Uh, you are always welcome to get in touch with me via Artistry Youth Dance. Thank you once again and the conversation has been brilliant. Let's make change, let's make it happen, and let's make it sustainable. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. <laughs>